Good morning, Without Walls Church. You can have a seat. It is an honor to be with you this morning. Um, it was a privilege to be a part of Escape and being with the youth this past weekend. You know, it was called Escape, and I wonder it was kind of like an escape room because I know some of the youth kept trying to get out of the building. Um, but it was, uh, if being with the youth and seeing what God is doing in them is any indication as to what God is doing in this city and Without Walls Church, it makes me very excited for you. Because God was moving in the prophetic, he was moving in power, students were surrendering and making commitments to him, and it really, it was an indicator, man, God is about to do something in the youth of this church. And I think that if you would give permission, they might actually stir you to have more hunger if you look over and see the way that they worship on Sunday mornings. You might look at them and be like, what do they know that I don't know? There's something about it. And so it was an honor to be a part of that. Pastor Michael and Tiffany, you guys are leading a movement with them. And it was an honor to be invited to just be a part of what God did here. And I just honor both of you and how you're serving this generation and raising a family, killing it at both of those things. So thank you for setting a good example. Can we honor them together, the youth pastors here? And then I also want to honor the senior pastors, Pastor Ken and Dina. Man, it takes genuine leadership to be able to linger in a moment like that. And it, I've only gotten to know you for a few hours, but for me to see a pastor steward a moment like that, who's been pastoring at a place faithfully for 17 years, but still be sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to say, let's lean into this moment a little longer. You are under great leadership here. You're serving some incredible pastors because it, take, it just takes genuine and authentic leadership to be so connected to the heart of the Father to know, no, we're not gonna move out of this too soon. We're not moving on to the next thing. Jesus is the next thing. And so it's just, I, I honor both of you and I look forward to getting to know you more. Um, he got, he's, as he mentioned, I am from Christ for the Nations, which is one of the best Bible colleges on the planet. Uh, hear that? Woo! All right, cool. Yeah, both of us. All right, awesome. Um, we, uh, I get to serve there in the capacity of being the youth extension of that ministry um, and doing an internship with young leaders, training them up and sending them around the world when they graduate, but also hosting camps and conferences across our events in 2021. We had over 5,000 teenagers come to the campus, and we saw incredible signs and wonders. Listen, there's no such thing as a youth Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a junior baptism of the Holy Spirit or junior miracles. I want to tell you that at our camps with a bunch of sweaty teenagers gathering together that smell like puberty and Axe body spray, <laughs> just kind of get numb to it after a while. We saw, we, 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 in, in moments of worship, we had testimonies of young, uh, young people who had scars on their arm from self-harming themselves that as they're worshiping Jesus, look at their arm and see that all of the scars had completely been erased from their arms. We have over, over 50 documented deliverances where teenagers showed up with demonic possession and getting completely delivered by the end of their time with us. We have testimonies of young ladies that in June were diagnosed with endometriosis and when they showed up to camp in July and then went back to their doctors after a camp, had clear reports saying that they were no longer diagnosed with endometriosis. I don't know about you, but I know that God is moving in the youth of this, this nation right now in this time. And it's not just reserved for those that are willing to get inside of the inside. That's why I love Without Walls because God is doing it in the youth. I mean, there was a teenager who got so stirred up, filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered during camp. Their youth youth group went to Six Flags over Texas after camp. It was literally camp ended Thursday night, Friday there at Six Flags. She sensed that there was someone who had a demon in the line while she's waiting for a ride, and as she begins to witness to them, that demon begins to manifest, and then she begins to cast out that demon as she's waiting for a line, a ride at Six Flags. That is the kind of generation that we're seeing being raised up right now, <laughs> that they would be at Six Flags and still operate in the authority that God has given them. Man, I, it gets me so excited. As you can tell, that's why I love what I get to do. And I don't do it alone. Um, I, I have a beautiful family back home in Dallas. I've been married to my wife for almost 10 years. I know you're looking at me. You're like, wow, this guy can't be older than 28. I'm actually 29. It's a common misunderstanding. Married for almost 10 years, and we have three beautiful biracial kids. We have my daughter, sick, uh, Ella, who is six, my son, Maddox, who is almost five, and then we have our newest addition, Marcus, who is one, and we have also, oh yeah, we have a dog, um, so trying to get used to that. But we have the, the beautiful family that I, I, they send their love. My wife does such a good job at whenever daddy leaves for a weekend or anything to come do ministry, she always has the kids come over and they pray over me and they send me out. That way they know it's not 
stop ministry taking away daddy, but they send daddy into ministry. And so if God moves this morning, it's because you had three kids praying for you before I came and that they were believing that God would touch your life. How many of you guys are ready for the word? You ready for it? Oh, come on. Listen, I don't do quiet church. It's not a, a big thing that I say is that I believe that a quiet church is a dead church. Anything that's healthy has a sound. And we can get loud just about anything else, but as soon as it comes to talking back in, in church, we get super apprehensive about it. I don't know why that is, but it's kind of like if our favorite sports team is playing, you have a grown man who just say, well, you know, I'm just uh, not really that passionate. I tend to be more reserved, you know. But as soon as his favorite sports team begins to win or lose, you see that passion come out real quick. And I'm still trying to understand the dichotomy of that. But whenever we're in the house of God, I believe that the word of God deserves a response. That there's something about, and it could be, it could be maybe you're just not fully comfortable with it. It could be, I, I, I'll take a Baptist amen. I'll take a Presbyterian head nod. A Latter-day Saints eye roll. Maybe a Catholic chant. Mm, I don't know. Or it could be, I, I, I tend to lean more towards the Murray, you are not the father, and then you just get up and start running around the room. Uh, whatever it looks like to you, I just know this is a safe place and a safe morning for you to talk back. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 in the very beginning. As you turn there, um, I just want to kind of preface this message by saying, I, I, as I was preparing for this and just trying to discern what God is wanting to do, I really feel like that this is a message for those who are in the middle. A message for those who are in the middle. You know the middle is that place specifically between where God has promised you something, but your process does not line up with the promise. Where what you see does not line up with what God said. That middle place is where your faith is tested. That middle place is where, where, where your identity, the enemy tries to shake who you really think you are. That's where everything you think you know about God is really put to the test, is in that middle season between what God said and what you are seeing, what God promised and what your process looks like. And so this morning, I want to speak to those of you who are in the middle because you're looking at the, the thing that God has promised, and yet, God, I don't possess it yet. How do I persevere when what I'm, the process that I'm in does not line up with your promises? It's not that he's not faithful, but I believe that there are really three key things that we can, we're going to see in this scripture this morning that are going to give you all of the encouragement and the tools that you need to persevere in the process and to make it in the middle. We come upon this story, um, just to give you context, Joshua and the Israelites had just come out of 40 years in the wilderness. They spent, they had, their, their, their whole, um, the nation escaped for the, the, the oppression through the deliverance of God from the Egyptians. They were in the wilderness, and they just, at this point in Scripture, crossed over the river Jordan. And they are coming into the land of Canaan, which was their birthright, their inheritance. It was everything that had been promised to them, everything that their parents had told them about, because all of the Israelites, except for two, were born in the wilderness, and they were raised on hearing about the promises of God, but yet not possessing them. And as soon as they cross over, in, over the river Jordan into the, the land of Canaan, the, the land that flowed with milk and honey, they had heard about it for years and years and years, hearing about what was rightfully theirs. As soon as they step into that land, they're met with opposition. As soon as they come into the land, they realize, wait a minute, it's not, there's, there's people here. There's things that aren't, that aren't supposed to be here. They come up to a city that's commonly known as Jericho. And as they come up to this, they realize that what was promised to us now has to be possessed by us. And so Joshua goes to meet with God. And this is what we're going to start reading in verse, Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, about God's conversation with Joshua as he gets instructions on what they're going to do and how they're going to possess their promise. I'm going to start reading again in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside. Look to your neighbor and say, shut up. I know you've been waiting to say that all morning. The whole drive here, you will look at, shut up. There you go. Give you your chance. Shut up. All right. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. 
None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called all the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns and before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city. Let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. I'm going to skip to verse 12. And then Joshua, on the first day, rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpet, trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day, they marched around the city once, and then returned to camp. So they did for six days." On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Verse 20, so the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. And so the conquest began of possessing what was rightfully promised to them. And this is what I want to speak to, these, just really taking what we see that was active in their life and how this can apply to your life as you begin to persevere in the process and possess what God has promised you. The first thing that you're going to have to have active in your life is this. You're going to have to have divine perspective. Amen. Amen. Divine perspective. This was so critical because Joshua was looking at the same thing God was and, and, and God says, see, I've already given them into your hands. Joshua's like, God, are we looking at the same thing? God, 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 do you see the same walls? The city is shut up inside and outside. No one's going out. No one's coming in. There's no vantage point. There's no point of strategy. This doesn't make sense. What do you mean you've already given it to me? See, where many of us make the mistake is that we'll look at the same thing that God's looking at, but we're going to be looking at it differently, and then we begin to criticize that he's not moving in our life because we don't have his perspective on it. We can look at the same doctor's report, but then question whether or not healing is for us because we're looking at the same thing, but we're not seeing it from a divine perspective. It's so interesting that God, when you read this, it says, see, God says, see, I have already given them into your hand. Isn't it fascinating that God speaks past tense about a battle that hasn't even happened yet? <sighs> oh, God is speaking past tense about situations you don't even know exist yet. God has already intervened on your behalf. Let me tell you right now that there is not a giant. God has not already cut the head off in your life. That many of the things that you're facing right now, I'm going to tell you, God has already gone before you and he has fought that battle for you and he has already guaranteed your victory. What you need to know about Jesus, if you're unfamiliar with him, is that there, you need to know this important thing. He never loses. He always wins. Jesus doesn't take L's. All he does is win, DJ Khaled style. This is who our God is. That he, just, he only knows victory. And so he tells Joshua, Joshua, if you see what I see, the way that I see it, and have divine perspective, you'll realize something very important. It is finished. When you see things the way that God sees them, you'll see them as though they already are finished. Joshua needed to have divine perspective. He, 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 I think when we read this, we can realize in this moment that God is not intimidated by impossibilities. That actually impossibilities are an invitation for God to do some of his greatest work. That the more impossible a situation may be getting in your life, that is 
almost it's like setting the scene for God to do some of his greatest miracles. The more impossible your situation may be, it doesn't mean that God is absent. It means he is about to do some of his greatest work. If you would, I really want to do this exercise, so if you would humor me real quick. Would you just like stick your hand out if you're comfortable and you're able. Stick your hand out towards me just exactly like I am. You can point it right at me. All right, just stick it right at me. I want you to stare at the back of your hand. Stare right at the back of your hand. Maybe there's a little freckle right there. Maybe you're kind of ashy and your knuckles are looking pretty rough. I don't know, just stare at the back of your hand, all right? And, and if you're doing this right, if you're staring at the back of your hand, I should be blurry and out of focus. Everything beyond your hand, it should be just slightly just distorted. It's, it's not fully in focus. Uh, it's blurry, you can't see it clearly. Now I want you to look in between your fingers. Look in between your fingers at me. If you're doing it right, you should see me clearly in focus and your hand should be blurry. It doesn't mean that your hand is not there. It's there, but you can see the thing beyond your hand. This is what it looks like to have divine perspective, is that you would know that there are circumstances that are there, and I'm not going to pretend like they don't exist. I'm just placing my faith in a greater reality. It doesn't mean that you completely ignore that what the doctor said, he said, and that this report says this, and if you're in debt, yes, you're in debt, and it might be there, but you are placing your perspective in a greater reality that is beyond what is temporary in the natural. Listen, what you see cannot determine your faith. Your faith must determine what you see. This is why we as a people call those things that aren't as though they are, that we walk by faith and not by faith. Sight, divine perspective will begin to unlock things in your life unlike anything else can. The Israelites had to take on God's perspective to see the walls the way that he saw them as finished, done, defeated, victory was theirs. How different would your life look if you have divine perspective in every situation? That when you get that text from a loved one that has disappointed you. When you get the report or that letter in the mail or the IRS says you owe them money and you're like, I don't have anything in that bank account and they want to take more from me, that you would know, man, I know that this is there, but I place my faith in a greater reality. God, would you help me see what you see the way you see it? The second thing that you can see in the Israelites' faith journey of possessing their promise is that they remain faithful to the process. The process of God is one that rarely makes sense. The processes of God rarely, no one's gonna pretend like they make sense. A man must lose his life before he can find it. Genesis 22, God tells Abraham, I'm gonna make you a father of many nations and then fulfills his promise and gives him a son and says, you know the thing that I gave you to fulfill that promise I gave you? Go sacrifice him. God? That doesn't make sense. No, rarely in the kingdom of God does his promise, does his process make sense. But if you are faithful to the process, it will always make a way for the promise. The process rarely makes sense, but if you're faithful to it, it will make a way. And what I've learned about the process is that if you're faithful to the processes of God, even though they don't make sense, even though they're kind of abstract, it's kind of like God told you, I'm going to bring you prosperity, but then he says, I want you to tithe. And you're like, give money? No, oh God, that don't make sense. It's like, but, 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 but what you've seen is God will also always take care of those who are faithful to his processes. Are you following me? Come on, are you with me? Yeah. All right, so we're seeing that, that if you're faithful to the process, it actually prepares you for the fulfillments of the promise. That if you're faithful to make sure you are healthy emotionally, mentally, financially, that before you get into you finding the person that you would come into covenant with and marry, a lot of you are so busy trying to make that process happen faster than it should that you're overseeing or, or overlooking a lot of things that you should be doing that would prevent a lot of the issues that you would have in marriage if you would just be faithful to the process. Whew. Someone, I just, yeah, I just felt that, you know, in this section over here, there's someone, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to be... But you being faithful to that process and making sure you are whole and you are complete and you don't think you need someone else to complete you, that'll prepare you for the fulfillment of a healthy marriage. Man, it, it, this honestly, this reminds me of one of my favorite movies growing up. I'm a 90s kid. Um, I, 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 even though I, I, came, I was born after the movie came out, I loved the movie The Karate Kid, the original one. Anybody else? Yeah? 
Okay, the original, you know, Mr. Miyagi, Daniel LaRusso, this, if you're unfamiliar with it, let me just let me get, break this down for you. So in this movie, there's a, a, a young kid who has a single mom, and they move to a new town, and they move into this apartment complex, and Daniel LaRusso, he is, um, goes to a new school, he's in high school, and he's pretty quickly the victim of some pretty severe bullying. He finds an interest in a girl whose boyfriend is like uh, kind of like a bully, stud. Him and his homies are all good at karate. And so Daniel, even though he's scrappy, man, he, can't, he doesn't stand a chance against these, this bully in the way that they fight. And so specifically, I believe it was in the movie, like Halloween night, um, he, 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 he makes some moves that really tick off the bully and his friends. And so they find him outside of his apartment complex in like an alleyway, and they begin to beat on this, they begin to punk this kid up. Like Daniel LaRusso is getting whooped. And as he, in the middle of his beating, this man, Mr. Miyagi, who is the maintenance custodial facilities guy of the apartment complex, comes outside and whoops up on all of these kids who were in high school, just begin completely tear them apart, embarrassing. How many of y'all want that kind of anointing? Or my older people that are like, listen, I want to be able to mess with the younger ones again. Lord, let me be able to just take a, take a chance. I want to call one of them out and just let them know what I got. You know, just so you know, youth is a state of mind, okay? So we're all young people this morning, all right? But Mr. Miyagi goes out there, tears these guys apart, and then Daniel LaRusso, he's like, yo, Mr. Miyagi, you know karate? I need you to please teach me everything you know about karate. Please, will you please, I need to be able to stand up for myself. So Mr. Miyagi, he says this profound thing in the movie. When I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like the kingdom, God is speaking to me. Mr. Miyagi says this, he goes, Daniel, son. I'm not going to do that impression the whole time. I can't keep it up. But he goes, Daniel-san, I promise to teach you everything I know about karate. As long as you promise me one thing, you don't question the process and how I teach you. So, so Daniel-san, he's like, bet. All right, I got it. Let's do it. You say less. I'm with you. So Mr. Miyagi has him show up at his home the next day. And he gets to this house, and he has all these classic cars in the, 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 the front yard and lots of things in the backyard, super nice. Like, um, he, he's a Japanese man, so he has some really Asian decor and plants and all this stuff. And um, Mr. Miyagi, or, or Daniel's son gets there, and he's super excited and eager to learn karate. He's been stretching. And Mr. Miyagi, he says, all right, let's start with your lessons. And he grabs a bucket and a sponge, and he goes out to his cars, and he begins to show him how to apply the wax to his cars and to clean his cars. And this is where we get the common, very popular phrase. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. And he begins to show him how to wax and clean his car. So Daniel's a little uh, perplexed at first, and he's like, okay, maybe I just need to prove myself before he teaches me karate. And so he begins to clean and wax the cars, gets them looking pristine, comes to Mr. Miyagi after he's done. He's like, Mr. Miyagi, I cleaned your cars, they're done. Now will you teach me some karate? And Mr. Miyagi says, all right, let's go. He takes him into the backyard. Gives him a paint bucket and a paintbrush. Takes him to the fence and shows him how to paint the fence. And he says, long strokes. Long strokes and has him paint the fence. And so Daniel's now like, okay, I think he's maybe playing with me and having me do all his dirty work. But maybe I just, let me do this and he'll finally teach me karate. So Daniel paints the whole fence around the whole backyard. The whole thing gets it painted, finally finishes it up. He's exhausted, comes to Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi, I have done everything you've asked. I'm ready. Now will you teach me karate? Mr. Miyagi says, follow me. He goes over to his deck, and he has a sanding block. He gets down. He begins to show him how to sand his deck. And as he's showing Daniel's son how to do this, Daniel's son gets infuriated. He says, man, this is ridiculous. All you're doing is having me do all of your dirty work. I am tired of being punked by you. I'm done. This is a joke. You never wanted to teach me karate. I'm out of here. And as he begins to walk away, Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel's son, wait. And he approaches Daniel LaRusso. And he says, wax on. And he goes to strike Daniel. And as he strikes Daniel, he has Daniel begin to use the wax on motions that he was doing when he was waxing the car. And as Mr. Miyagi strikes, Daniel waxes on. And he says, 
paint the fence. And as he goes to strike him, he begins to paint the f- using the motion he learned. And what Daniel didn't realize is that as, as he was doing all the things that Mr. Miyagi was having him do, he was actually in the process of learning how to defend himself against every attack that Mr. Miyagi would throw at him. I'm telling you right now, the process of God may not make sense, but if you are faithful to steward the process, the season of being in the middle, that it may feel like you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, but that's where God is teaching you how to steward and handle the promise that he has given you. What if the Israelites had given up on the sixth lap? Like, think about this. They are so eager to possess what is theirs. Joshua goes to meet with God. And I can imagine the Israelite army, all of these young, eager soldiers who are ready for battle because they haven't seen it yet. And they see Joshua go off to meet with God and then come back. Like I could imagine the soldiers right now. Man, I'm ready for war, baby. We're going to get this thing down. We're going to throw down. I got my playlist ready. I'm, re- I'm hyped up. I got back in black on repeat. I'm ready to do that. Let's go. The boys are ready. They're hyping each other up. They see Joshua walking back. They're like, oh, let's go. Joshua, what did he say? What did Yahweh say? Let's do it. Joshua comes back. I have spoken with Yahweh. He has given me the instruction on how we shall defeat these Jericho uncircumcised. Why does I always do that for like throwing shade at people in the Old Testament uncircumcised? Like that would be really weird today. Anyways. Like, yo, cut me off in traffic. You uncircumcised, little. (laughs) Don't do it. He said, he comes back, he says, I have spoken with God. This is the strategy in how we will defeat Jericho. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Here we go. What's the strategy? Joshua says, we're going to walk. And then we're going we're, we're gonna to walk some more. <laughs> what? You can see the soldiers complaining. Man, Joshua's just as crazy as Moses. We thought we were getting someone better. It's worse. You see the walls that they're, walk? These are men of war. What is walking? So they get up on the first day and they walk around. They're like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we're looking for a vantage point. Maybe we're scouting out the walls, and so we're looking for a weak spot. Okay, we'll walk. So they walk around the walls. They make that one lap, and they're like, all right, I'm sure Joshua saw a weak point. I think I saw some weak rocks over there. Joshua, what's next? Let's go back to camp. They go back to camp, go to sleep, wake up the next day. Let's go walk. Let's close those rings. They walk around the wall, day two, come back to camp, day three, day four, day five, day six. You know, when you read the narrative of Joshua giving the instructions to the Israelites, he never told them how many days they were going to have to march. Not once does he mention to them how many days this is going to go on. He just said, this is what we're going to do. Could you imagine the Israelites out of frustration and just not really understanding what was happening in the process, maybe on the sixth day or even the sixth lap, not knowing how close they were to breakthrough, giving up. Imagine them on the sixth lap on that seventh day saying, you know what, we are tired of walking. We're tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Joshua, you are not fit to be our leader. We don't trust you. We are going to come up with our own strategy and do our own thing. We're going to do things that make sense to us, and we're going to try and fight this battle our own way. And what if they had given up on the sixth lap, not knowing how close they were to breakthrough? I'm going to tell you, some of you right now, in whatever situations that you've been contending for breakthrough, I feel like prophetically God is wanting to say, you're on your sixth lap. That it has felt so frustrating and it's been almost antagonizing because you know what's been promised to you and you've been this close to giving up. But I'm here to tell you, you're on your sixth lap. And if you would walk every lap, if you would pray every prayer, if you would go evangelize with that lost loved one every time as though that's going to be the last time, let me tell you, one day you'll be right. 
because one day it will be the last time that you have to do that. One day it will be the last time that you have to pray that prayer for healing. One day when you respond to the altar for breakthrough in that situation, it will be the day of fulfillment. You have, I would say for, there's many of you, you're on lap six, don't give up. You're closer to breakthrough than you realize. You are closer than you realize. Remain faithful to his process. It'll make a way for every promise that he has for you. Trust him in the middle. The last thing that I see, the third thing that I see that's active in their life that we have to understand as well. First thing that they had was they had to have divine perspective. The second thing is that they had to remain faithful to the process. The third thing that you're gonna have to have is you have to learn how to raise your praise. Amen. And it really sounds good when it's phonetic, right? Amen. It's just a little bit more anointed when you can get those. Raise your praise. Sha da da day. <laughs> raise your, but honestly, and it's kind of like when you hear this story, you get really excited when you see how after the walls fell, man, it was a triumphant moment. They get to go in and possess the land. But what's profound is that they actually praised God before the walls fell. Because the word that God gave to Joshua and the word that Joshua gave to the soldiers for shout was not like a verbal shout. It wasn't like a, a, a ah, ah. You know, it wasn't like them yelling like, ah, like an ogre, you know. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that kind of shout. The Hebrew word for the word that they used for shout there is the Hebrew word ruach. It's the same word that is used when it, it communicates how God breathed into man, the wind of God. It's also, the, it's, it's, it's used to, to be a, a war cry or shout of triumph or even a joyful noise. That's why it's the same Hebrew word used in Psalm 95, 1, where it says, make a, let us make a joyful noise unto God, the rock of our salvation. So Joshua, at this moment where he has told them to be silent for seven days, and on the seventh day for seven laps, and they get to this moment where he looks at all of his men of war, and he says, now is the time to praise. And they're like, for what? You want us to praise now, Joshua? There's still walls there. We haven't seen God move yet. What do you mean praise? What do you mean make a joyful noise? What do you, we, we have not seen the fulfillment come yet. What do you mean praise now? And then as he began to give the instruction, no, I need you to praise right now. Ruah! And as they begin to look forward, they don't see anything. But as they could look back, you know what they could see? The faithfulness of God. So though I don't see anything in front of me, you know what? You are good, Jehovah. You are good, Yahweh. You're the one that delivered us from the oppression of the Egyptians. You're the one that led us through the Red Sea on dry ground. You're the one that have, have protected us in the wilderness. You caused our clothes to not tear or get worn. You provided manna from the sky. You led us with the cloud by day and the fire by night. You led us over the Jordan. You have been faithful and you have been with us and you'll be with us now. And as they begin to praise God for who he was, they they saw him for who he is, and the walls began to fall down. I'm going to tell you right now, some of you need to learn how to praise before your walls fall. You need to learn how to praise him before you see the breakthrough. Oh, I just feel the Spirit of God on this, that you would understand the best way to confuse the enemy is to throw the party early. <laughs> that you would have the, 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 the maturity as a Christian, as a son or a daughter of God that says, Though I don't see it, though I know it looks like he is not here and he's not with me, I can look back and say, you know what? He's never let anybody down and he's not about to start with me. And I'm gonna tell you right now, our God is so worthy that he never has to do another thing for you to still receive praise that he deserves. He never has to do another thing for you to still receive all the praise that he is worthy of. What you need to understand is that praise is powerful. Your worship is a weapon. That when you begin to stand in difficult circumstances and lift your voice and lift your hands and say, God, you are faithful, things do begin to happen because praise is prophetic. 
It's just, it, it, it does things that you are unknown, uh, that's unknown to us, but it begins to move things in the atmosphere. They begin to praise even though the walls hadn't fallen yet. Something about praise that just paves the way. You know, as the worship team comes up to join me, I want to share just the story of when I was a child. Um, I was around uh, elementary school age, 8, 9, 10. And I remember my mom used to come up to me, and she would rub the back of my head. Like, just rub. I had shorter hair then. This is a new thing. I'm trying to figure it out. You know, I'm turning 30 in April, so I'm like midlife crisis type deal. Let me grow my hair out and see what happens. No, I'm not from California. <laughs> Texas. I drive a truck. All right. Anyways. <laughs> Why do I get a bigger response on that than I did about the promises of God? All right, Anyways. As I was growing up, 8, 9, 10 years old, I remember my mom would come up to me and rub the back of my head. And as a, as a young boy, that could ruin your street cred real fast. And so I remember I was like, I remember one time I just kind of like slapped the way my mom's hand. I was like, Mom, you can't touch me like that. You can't rub my head like that. I'm a grown man. You can't touch me like that. Why do you keep touching me like that, Mom? And so she, one time, when I asked her this question, she responds and she goes, Micah, um, I got to tell you, when you were young, you were two years old. I was pregnant with your sister, and we were home alone. It was just me and you. I was doing some laundry in the living room, and you were just acting up and being very difficult. I was like, that doesn't sound like me. Which kid was this? She was like, you were being really difficult, so I went to, uh, uh, you were doing something, and I went to pick you up, and as I went to pick you up, and you pushed away from me. When you pushed away from me, you fell back, and the back of your head hit the corner of our coffee table. And when it hit the corner of your co the, our coffee table, you went unconscious and blood just began to literally gush out of the back of your head. It was just flowing out. And we lived, at this time, I'm from North Carolina, and so she's like, we lived in a very rural area. There weren't a lot of people around us, and so I, I grab a towel and I try to cup the back of your head to stop the bleeding, and I just pick you up, and I run to our neighbor's house to see if they could help me. And when I get there, no one's home. And we had one other neighbor, so I run over to their house, and I'm just carrying you. You're still, you're not responding, and blood is still coming out. And I get to their house, and they're not home either. So I fall to my knees in our neighbor's front yard, and she's like, Micah, I just, when you were born, I had just gotten exposed to the character and nature of God as a healer and began to learn about how he heals. And so desperate, holding you in their front yard, in their front yard, I just began to cry out to God that he would heal you in this moment. And as I began to pray for healing, I saw the back of your head, the skin stitch back up, and the blood stopped flowing out. So she says, every time I'm facing something that looks difficult, every time I'm facing something that seems hard or as if God's not with me, I rub the back of your head and I feel that scar. And it reminds me of how God was with me that day when he healed you and he'll be with me again. For some of you, you need to look back and rub the scars of your past, feel the moments, remind yourself of his faithfulness and how he was with you then and he'll be with you again. Some of you, you need to get better and learn how to speak to your future about your past. Learn how to speak to the walls in front of you about the God who was with you. This is what it looks like to carry a sound of praise is that you could go through any circumstances and still have a joyful noise on the inside of you. They, there could be things in front of you that don't look like they're praiseworthy, but you can know you have a God who's still worth praising. It's an old phrase I've heard many pastors use, but many of you have to stop complaining to God about how big your walls are and start talking to your walls about how big your God is. And so if everyone would stand with me in this moment, we're just going to end this releasing a sound of praise over our problems. We're gonna throw the party a little, some of you, you are battling sickness, you're battling disease, 
you're battling lack, you're, bat you're battling uh, uh, divorce, you're battling uh, marriage problems, your kids, lost family members, there's drama. Some of you are, you're, you're still struggling to find a job. There are things that are worth being concerned about, but right now we are gonna shift our gaze from looking at the problems and look at him. And so we're all over this room. If you need to come to the front, you can come to the front. If you want to stay where you are, but I challenge you, get into a place and a posture that would allow you to develop a, sound, a ruach moment where though there may still be walls standing, we are going to praise the God who is faithful. Come on, would you just lift your hands all over this place? Can we just lift the, the voice of God without needing someone to lead us in a song in this moment? Can you just begin to speak to him? Can you begin to release who he is over your situations? Come on, just begin to praise him. You are faithful, God. You're faithful, Jehovah. You are Emmanuel, God with us. You're the one that rescued me from my perversion. You're the one that healed me from that sickness. You're the one that restored my mind. When I was anxious and I was stressed, you gave me peace that surpassed understanding. Come on, who is he to you? Who is he to you? Come on, look at, look at your past. Who has he been to you? Speak to your future. Speak to those walls. Uh, who is he to you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.